Generally speaking, if you tell somebody they're doing something wrong, quote unquote wrong, it's just natural to become defensive. But if you tell them through a myth, you remove them from the situation and, and then it allows you to look at the situation objectively. So you're doing some deep, soulful work in the world, which uh, we try to stay abreast of. You've got some new things that you are in development and you're trying to sustain some things that have good momentum. But I thought it would be important for our listeners and viewers to get a sense of the work you do and how you came to it, how mm. this came to be so yeah. significant to <laughs> you as a human being. Well, but, but first also, like, or maybe in that, just make sure like you describe what it is that yes, you do. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, okay. Great. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking. So, so it started while wow. uh, it started. <laughs> Back when I went, uh, when I went through the African based rights of passage, that's, so I was around 37 years old. Then. I'm, I'm mm. 66 now. And uh, when I went through that African based rights of passage, that's when I was introduced to the work of Carl Jung. Okay. I was introduced wow. to the work of Jung through the African based rights of passage. I was introduced to the work of Joseph Campbell through the African based rights of passage. So I started reading Jung, and I was just amazed at, uh, I, I read Portable Jung, and I was amazed at his chapter on the phenomenology of self and, and uh, the shadow and the anima and the wise old man, and then, then, then the chapter on synchronicity. So I started reading more Jung, and then I started to read uh, Joseph Campbell, Power Myth. And uh, I, I was reading some other Campbell stuff, but I just, what amazed me was that reading all these different myths no matter where they were from, they were basically saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then, and then Campbell's one sentence, uh, when you follow your bliss, doors open where you thought there'd be no doors. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was 38 years old at the time, looking out my window, University of Akron, and I asked myself, what was my bliss? I asked myself, what was it that I wanted to do? Not what could I do? What did I uh. want to do? And my exact words, my exact words were play my drum and tell mythological stories. Okay. So let me back up. Let me back up. So uh, I got introduced. Uh, af after reading Jung Campbell, I got introduced to the work of Michael Mead. And so, mm -hmm. and so <laughs> I read Mead's book, Men in the Water of Life. I read that book four and a half times. I purchased God. that book for over 170 some people. I still got the names in the back of the book who I purchased and gave that book to. But, but basically, what I found, uh, uh, because at the time I was at the University of Akron and I was counseling like urban youth. I was counseling primarily male youth. And it was like pulling teeth, getting them to talk. And, and from reading Mead's book, the first two myths dealt with the father-son relationship. The next two dealt with mother-son relationship. Then he had a myth that dealt with initiation through sorrow and, and one that dealt with initiation through desire. And any initiation is going to be a symbolic death and rebirth. And so from reading that, it just helped me to understand so much about my life just from reading mm. a myth and, and, and listening to his interpretations. And so from that... Uh, I said, well, I'm going to start using this with the youth and the adults because I was running parent workshops. So that's what I started to do. <laughs> I just started using because it because it helped me to understand so much about my life. Because what I found is that generally speaking, if you tell somebody they're doing something wrong, quote unquote wrong, it's just it's just natural to become defensive. But if you tell them through a myth, you remove them from the situation and, mm -hmm. and then it allows you to look at the situation objectively. So mm -hmm. I'm going to say for a good five, six years, I just lived off the work of, of me. Okay. I was just doing, I was just doing the, the hunter and the sun myth, the, the water of life myth, the firebird myth, uh, the half boy myth. And then, uh, and then I start working, <laughs> I start working with high school dropouts in Akron and Cleveland. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm not going to be able to just keep doing it this way. And so because I, I, cause I'm going to have these boys for a year, I'm going to have these boys for an entire year. So what I did, I just started to find other myths. I started to find other myths and create questions, create questions that went to each portion of the myth. Because I would tell a portion of the myth, stop at critical points and then ask them what resonated with them in the myth. No right or wrong answer. 
no right or wrong answers just to create discussion. And then I would just, have, you know, then I would have questions for each portion of that myth here again to create to create uh, discussion and just to get you to think. And uh, wherever I went, it, it worked. And it's, it's just <laughs> I just been in, I've been in the right place at the right time and just surrounded by the right people. So that's how the it doors started. opened. Yeah, the doors yeah, that's opened. How it, yeah, so yeah. that's so that's how it started. Um, and when you say it worked. Okay, so so I got. I have three anecdotal stories, but I'll tell you two of them. I'll tell you two. Okay. <laughs> okay. And uh, because when I first, you know, doing it, folks are like, what is he doing? Okay, what is he doing? <laughs> and uh, because because when I was, you know, when I was telling people, I wanted to play my drum and tell a mythological story, but people were like, who end up? going to pay you to <laughs> play your drama and tell mythological stories. Okay, so anyway, so I uh, was working with the high school dropouts in Akron, in Akron and uh, we were doing the water of life myth. And uh, in this myth, the boys are crying. Okay, the boys are crying because their father, the king, is sick. And they're sitting on the castle steps crying. These high school dropouts, now, now these young men were like ages 16 to like 22. They took it upon themselves. We were near the end of the year, but they took it upon themselves to go around that circle and talk about the last time they cried. These high school dropouts, okay? So, so you know, full. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, so I'm like, wow, this myth is the ticket. Okay, that was the first mm-hmm. one. And then the second time I was in Cleveland working with high school dropouts. And in Cleveland, uh, the, the gentleman would give me like 30 of them at a time, just me, okay? And I had them for like an hour and a half, three different sets of, of, of youth, hour and a half. I'm like, and, and, and at the time, Cleveland was like rated the poorest city in the country. It was ridiculous, okay? There was no way that I was gonna be able to keep the attention of 30-something high school dropouts from Cleveland for an hour and a half. So, so what I started to do, and I would go home, and I'm like, I know I got have something to offer these youth, you know, through the myths, and blah, blah blah. So I told them, I came back to one day, and I, I said, Hey, uh, I'm gonna give you the first 15 minutes. You do whatever you want to do. I'll give you the last 15 minutes. You do whatever you want to do. But I said that hour, that hour in between, you give me that hour. You give me that hour. We do these myths. So. It was pretty chaotic that first 15 minutes to last 15 minutes. I'm letting them do whatever they want to do. It's in the summer. So they outside, they like freaking their black and mouth, which is like stuff with cigars, okay, and blah, 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 blah. And just, just a lot of joking going around. I mean, it was cool, but it was chaotic. And it was their 15 minutes. It was their 15 minutes. It was chaos. And one of the youth hollered out. He was sitting in the back. He hollered out, Kwame, tell us another story. And I was just like, wow, this is in there 15 minutes. And that's when I said, hey, this myth is the ticket. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, when I say it works, a it, it, um, friend of mine, Dunya, we, we're doing these workshops with Silverman like a few weeks ago. She's like, wow, Kwame, you have created a simple method that uh, you've created a simple method that elit- that 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 makes people ask answer complex questions okay oh, yeah, yeah. in an immediate amount of time so wherever we go it's wow it just it, it, it works because it makes people you know r- respond really really respond to the deeper questions in a simple way in a simple mm-hmm. way well it seems to me that it were it, it it uh when you work with these stories you're entering into the world of the imagination oh, yeah Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so before we start, before we start any myth and, and in, in, in like a year, when we're with the youth for a year in school, you get maybe two, three myths. Okay. It's according to how long the myths are. Wow. But, 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 um, like on a, like on a Saturday when we would have them for a Saturday, like four hours, it might take us, might take us three months to get through one myth. So like in, so like in, a seven year period, the youth that we had, like four to seven years, we might get through twenty five myths, okay, in seven years. But you 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 you're talking about setting the stage. And so we always have 
we would tell the golden age, okay? Before each myth, we would tell the golden age uh, to get them in that, in that uh, mythic, mythic, a mythic space, okay? So mm-hmm. if we had time today, remind me to tell you the golden age before we, mm-hmm. before we go off into a myth. Okay. 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 Great. Yeah. Kwame, could you just frame, I, we'll probably go into it more, um, how you bring a myth to life with a group? Because I think many of our Jungians might read a myth to personally amplify it, or maybe they'll read the Book of Symbols or what Jung had said. But it takes a special skill to bring a myth, bring it alive for a group of people. And how how do you engage them and unpack the myth such that it goes on for weeks or months? Well, thank you. Uh, one of the mm-hmm. first things is that you, you got to set an environment uh, that, that they feel safe. Okay, so like the youth that we work with here again, we'll have them for like at least a year. Okay, if not three years, seven years. Uh, but even with the adults, the first thing is creating a safe environment. Uh, uh, Letting people know that what's said in that room stays in that room. And just, uh, I have like a little agenda I go through and just really believing that uh, I call it choosing the womb and, and how each of us were, you know, brought here to, to complete something on this earth. And, and the fact that we're in that room together, there's, it's far too coincidental for it to be coincidence. Okay, so you're setting the stage. First off, it's setting the stage to make a safe environment. And then through the myth, I, 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 I'll tell the myth through the beat of a drum. Okay, tell the myth through the beat of a drum. And so, and so just the drum, it, 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 it soothes you, puts you in a trance-like state. And then just, uh, like I say, we tell the golden age first, and then just tell the uh, tell that portion of a myth through the beat of a drum. Uh, <laughs> they all have journals. They all have journals. There's no right or wrong answers. So that's another thing that that makes it uh, a little more comforting. <laughs>